2 Peter chapter 2. And, and I want you to get there first, and then I'm going to have you turn over to the book of Romans chapter 8. I'll speak tonight on uh, Are You an Easy Target? And we've been looking at Second Peter, and also those who've been coming on Wednesday night, we've been looking at uh, something in a similarity, and actually Peter and Jude kind of correlate with one another. And uh, so uh, some of the things would kind of be overlapping to some degree. And by the way, let me make this statement. The reason I'm having to go to Romans chapter 8, because some of this material can be quite heavy, so to speak. And sometimes it can even be almost discouraging. But I trust that what I'm going to share with you tonight will be an encouragement to you rather than discouragement in regards to your life. But we are easy targets uh, for the false teachers, evil ones, those that would try to get us to turn away from the Lord, uh, those that would try to do us harm, whatever it might be the case. So, with your uh, finger or a piece of paper in the book of Second Peter, look over at Romans chapter 8, if you would please, and look down to verse 31 to begin with. I want to start on a positive note to a great degree in regards to our study tonight. And uh, Paul had something to say that I think can really help us as we face things in this world. Um, I, I was thinking this week about, I can speak only for myself of course, but I have felt like um, in the past uh, I have been a target in regards to uh, the devil uh, trying to get us discouraged, trying to get us down. Anybody else have that problem? The devil trying to make you discouraged? Raise your hand. All right, so I'm not in the boat by myself. All right, uh, he, he'll try to do something. Well, you just, have you ever been in this place? I, I know that uh, the devil can say, you're just not doing enough. You ever feel like that in a Christian life? I'm just not doing enough. Well, that can be good and that can be bad. If you are doing what God wants you to do, you never have to worry about that thing. And I have to keep coming back to that principle time and time again. Uh, I was talking to an individual tonight, and they know who I'm talking about, so I, but I'm not going to mention any names. But uh, my wife and I, we have a verse that is really important in our lives. And it might help you when you begin to get discouraged a little bit, and you get down, and you feel like, boy, I'm being targeted from every direction. This person's saying something about me. Uh, another person's doing this to me, so forth and so on, or whatever may be the case. And uh, we quote a verse, Isaiah 26, 3. It goes like this. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. You see, it's putting our constant trust in the Lord that He's in control of our lives. He uh, watches over us. Matter of fact, every Sunday morning, matter of fact, almost every service, I, I try to get in here in the auditorium, and I pray a divine hedge of thorns around this ministry, that God would just bless the people in this ministry, and they would help them not to be discouraged, not to be down, but to be lifted up and drawn closer to the Lord. And that, that's the objective of our message, is try to help me, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, lift you up. And so, look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 31 there, if you begin with me. It says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be what? Do you believe God's for us tonight? Would you say amen? God is for us. And so he says, if God be for us, uh, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, and this is one of the ways he shows us he's for us. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, that's one of the first things he says. Look, he delivered Jesus up for us. But look at the next verse. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who does what? Also, come on, read with me, maketh intercession for us. That's the second thing that God does to help us to realize, look, though you're targeted in this world by the devil, you're targeted by those that would try to do you harm or target you for some other reason, uh, he says, look, God is for you. God is helping you. He's praying for you. Remember what uh, Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, I'm praying for you. And when you convert, in other words, you get things straightened out after you've denied me, then just remember this. I still care for you. And God does. And he cares for you and me day by day. All right, if you would, turn over to the book of Second Peter, chapter number 2. And I want you to look down at verse number 10. 
We're going to read down through verse number 16. Uh, that might give us some insight in regards to how and why we're being targeted in our life and what you and I can do about it. You see, there's one thing to uh, have something be in opposition to our lives. There's another thing to recognize that we have uh, a rescuer. We have someone who cares for us that can help us as we face. And we're studying primarily the false teachers here in the book of Second Peter. And on Wednesday night, we're studying ab uh, about those individuals that are antichrist or those who, and I like to say it very emphatically, apostates. They're really not Christians are not really for the things of God. They've crept in among the people of God to kind of discourage them or get them down or try to turn them away from true biblical teachings and detour them from what the main objective of. And listen to me, folks. It's happening all over the world. They're sneaking into churches. They're turning people now, I, I don't mind saying this tonight. Turn them away from true worship to the Lord to a false worship. Think about it, okay? And I'm, like I say, I'm not trying to be so negative tonight about things, but I'm just trying to lay it out as it is to try to help you to realize what's happening in America. If you don't see what's happening, you're not really looking, okay? You need to begin to see what's really happening in America and around the world in our churches that uh, are moving away from the faith. And uh, Peter and Jude both hit this head on in regards to what's happening. Look down at verse number 10. And we're not going to go back to verse number one uh, as far as talking about the false prophets, but we're going to reveal some of the things about them. There in verse 10 it says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. In other words, here is a thought. They're moving away from the fact of authority, specifically biblical authority. All right? Turn it away. Now, he'll give us some examples of that when we move over in uh, one of the verses there, when he talks about, in verse number 15, uh, Balaam. And if we were to go to the book of Jude, he talks about Korah. And Korah rejected authority. Who did he, wh whose authority did he reject? He rejected God. Now, we know that Moses was one that would gave the commandment or gave the statements, but uh, Korah and uh, his buddies, they didn't want to accept it. They, they rejected what Moses had to say. People today will reject the Word of God, but they'll accept all kinds of other teachings and sayings and go along with the crowd along those things. So he says, look, they avoid, they go against authority, specifically biblical authority. Then he comes to verse 11. Look at it very quickly. He gives an example here in regards to the angels who are greater than these individuals. Look at them. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing against uh, action accusation against them before the Lord. Now, keep your place in Peter and flip over, turn to the right and go to the book of Jude. And uh, there's an illustration there of an angel called Michael. If you look down at verse number nine, matter of fact, let's jump back to verse eight because that gives the same, ver same thought as Peter gave in verse number 10 in second Peter chapter two. He says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. In other words, they despise uh, the authority and so forth and speak evil of dignities. All right. So they reject authority, whether it be biblical, whether it be uh, that of a social nature, they reject the rules and laws of those things were laid down. Now let's go back a little bit. Our country has moved away from the basic principles that our country was established on. And they're just knocking all those things out. They want to take away from the Constitution and everything else. Why? Because of these false individuals who have moved in to try to destroy, listen, try to destroy a nation that we believe originally was based upon the principles of God's Word. Can I hear an amen? 
Go back and study your history. All right. Then he gives the illustration in verse 9 there of Jude. He says, yet Michael. Now, Michael was one of the archangels. You're familiar with that. And Gabriel was an archangel. But the one that fell was, of course, Lucifer. He was also an archangel. Each of these had one-third command over the angels of heaven. So he says, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, God says, look, here's these individuals that come in, these false teachers, these apostates, these antichrists, and they begin to teach all these things that are contrary to uh, not only biblical principles, to, but to the rules and regulations of our country. Then it comes down to verse number 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, he, he, there, he's, he, he's stopping to say, you know, this is happening. But he says, I'm going to have the final word. Aren't you glad about that tonight? God has the final word. Judgment's going to come. But until then, he says, I've got to tell you some things. I've got to describe some things to help you to understand. Uh, and Amos, it says, my people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. So... Jude and Peter together uh, join in to give us some information about these individuals. And he's describing it down through these verses. Let's go on and read verse 13 through 16. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count all pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots are they and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have ex exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken what? Three words there. Come on, say it out loud. The right way. You say, preacher, is there a right way? Absolutely. The Bible gives the right way. Hello, say amen. He has the right way. Now, look back there, if you would, in verse number 15. And are gone astray, following the way of Balaam. Now, watch this real closely. What was the way of Balaam? The way of Balaam was receiving a reward to curse Israel, but he rejected, of course. But he was out to get a reward, or get what we call gain, all right? That's an indication of someone who was trying to take advantage of people. All right? And of course, he was taking advantage of the people of Israel. All right, he says, the way of Balaam. So you have the wrong way, you have the right way. And who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. You see, God will give a warning to any of us if we will take it. And in this case, we know that he used the mule back there in uh, the book of Numbers uh, to tell, hey, look, Balaam, this is wrong. You better not curse the people of Israel. God has blessed them, and you better care be careful. And so he, he doesn't do it. So we get targeted all the time. I mean, all over the place, so to speak. And false teachers are at, at constantly trying to attack us. They're trying to go after that which is right. And uh, it, it, listen, if you believe the Bible today, many Christians laugh at you and say, listen, you, you don't need to believe the whole Bible. There's, there's errors in this Bible. Uh, there's, there's things you don't, listen, that was for the Old Testament people. We don't have to do that anymore. You know, we live in a new day and time. That's old fashioned. Praise God for old fashioned. You, if you were to get a letter from us, you'll see on that letter that we still believe in the old fashioned, the old time gospel. And we're not going to change. Because everything this Bible says is the truth. And we're going to walk and we're going to live by the truth. I, I began to think about uh, uh, being an easy target. Now, you and I don't live in Africa or, you know, some place where there's a lot of wild animals. Uh, I, we, we're not around that. But there are those that uh, do live in those, at parts of the country and so forth. And, of course, the most uh, uh, drastic animal you've got to be careful about is a lion. And uh, it, it, that's a beast. 
And uh, not only does Peter talk about it, but uh, Jude talks about uh, the beast. And we leave ourselves open sometimes for the lion. Do we have anybody that's identified as a lion? The devil, right? The devil walks about as a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he devour, uh, may devour. Have you ever noticed something about a lion? Now, I, I, I love, uh, you know, uh, things on TV that uh, show about the wild animals and so forth. Uh, some years ago, uh, I had the opportunity, I don't know if any of you knew it, there was a gentleman that came here, and I'm trying to think who he was close to and knew. But anyway, he invited me down to his house to visit him, and he was interested in our church. And I went to his house. Inside of his house, he had all kinds of trophies of all types of wild animals from all over Africa. I mean, he had, now he didn't have a full elephant there, but he had the, uh, he had some of the legs or whatever you call the, that part down that far, sort of about like that. Uh, he had zebras, uh, they, he had lions, he had uh, rhinos, he had, I mean, just every kind of animal. I mean, I was astonished. I, I walked in and I thought I was in a zoo, you know, but they weren't alive. They, of course, they were, had been stuffed and so forth and so on. And I began to think about wild beast. And how those that uh, are wild beasts, they're open to target you because of the fact that they want to devour you. And that's what the devil wants to do with these false teachers he uses. They want to devour you in regards to your life. Listen, we know they can't take away our salvation, but can they take away the joy of the Lord from your life? Most certainly. They can take away your purity. They can take away the walk that you have with the Lord Jesus. And so, Peter here wants to help us in identifying these individuals that we're not caught up, that we're not caught off guard and become targets for them. So, look back here, Second Peter, would you, real quickly. Uh, he begins right there in verse number 10, uh, talking about those who reject authority. By the way, uh, they, uh, over in Jude, he talks about some identification. So let me mention these real quickly for you that have not been uh, in our study on Wednesday night. He tells us about an individual, about going in the way of Cain. Can anybody tell me what that means? Let's talk a little bit tonight. I'm going to be informal. Does anybody know what it means to go in the way of Cain? It means do what he wants to do rather than what God wanted him to do. Huh? What did he do? Did he know about the fact of offering sacrifices in the right way? Most certainly. So did his brother Abel. That's the reason Abel chose the right way. But Cain did not want to do it that way. You know why? Because he was a farmer. And Abel, or I should say a, a, a shepherd or a farmer who raised animals and so forth like that. But um, Abel was one who took and uh, he did raise, excuse me, Abel was that. And Cain was one who did the crops of the field and so forth like that. So he says, hey, I'm going to bring my crops to God and offer them. And God says, no, you won't. But if you do that which is right, I'll accept it. Well, he got mad, see. Because he wanted his own way. Folks, it's not our way. It's his way. It's his way. The Bible way. Regardless of we like it or not, it's the best thing for us. And so Peter says, look, we've got to be careful about these things. We've got to be careful about these that reject authority. And Cain rejected authority, not only of his own parents, but the authority of God, which was the utmost. Then they ran after the way of Balaam, that is, was doing things for self-gain. Then gain sayings of Korah, going against the word of God that God had given to Moses. Then uh, there in Jude, uh, uh, he says, look, you got to be careful about these individuals. And he goes on. Matter of fact, uh, would you do this for me real quickly, since some of you can't come on Wednesday night. Turn back to the book of Jude. And look down at verse number 12 that actually begins a few more things about these individuals. He not only talks about, like I say, Cain, and he talks about Balaam. He talks about Korah, these three individuals that we find. But he uh, goes a little bit further in verse 12, and he talks about something, about characteristics of these individuals. These are spots in your feast. In other words, they're going to make a mess of your feast to the Lord. When they feast with you, they feed themselves without fear. 
Stop right there. Let me give you an illustration. When churches are flippant about, for example, the Lord's Supper, they take it nonchalantly. That is something they have got to be careful. Feeding themselves. In other words, they've gone there for a feast. They've not gone there. Uh, Paul rebuked that, that there in the book of, uh, was it, First Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, he rebuked that. He says, look, that's wrong. He says, you folk, he says, eat at home. Don't come here as a, as a feast. But those will come in among you and do it, uh, not, uh, you know, uh, flippantly. And I've seen this done. And uh, the Bible talks about the fact of the Lord's Supper. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do what? You do show the Lord's death till he come. We got to be careful. It doesn't matter how often you take it. You take it every Sunday, but it ought to be taken with meaning. Amen? It ought to be taken with a reverence and respect to the fact that the bread and the blood represent the body of the Lord Jesus and his shed blood. When churches have a Lord's have the Lord's Supper flippantly, and they just come in and take it, and then there's nothing. We were in a church. They had the Lord's Supper. The pastor never opened up the scripture and read in regards to what the Lord's Supper was all about and had a time of examination. You think that's important? He says, let a man examine himself and then let him take, partake of that bread and of that juice, okay? Uh, representing the blood of the Lord Jesus. So, we've got to be careful that we don't do things flippantly, that we take time as a reverent type of thing to remember the Lord's death till he comes. So, we've got to be careful about those things. We should not be, uh, you know, uh, nonchalant in regards to our worship, even on Sunday. We can come in, you know, just go through the motions that we don't come together in sweet fellowship to exalt the Lord. Uh, after all, folks, who's it about? Isn't it about Jesus? It's about Him. That's why we're here tonight. It's about Him, exalting Him. And then, of course, we get the overflow, the, over, uh, the flow of the cup that God, so to speak, gives to you and me because we do what He wants us to do. So, and he, he looks here in verse number 12 there of Jude, real quickly. And I want to move right along to finish up here. He says, uh, look, when they feast with you, feed themselves with fear. Clouds they are without what? Water. Now, he's speaking of a cloud. The natural thing for that cloud to do is to do what? To give precipitation, right? Okay, now I know there are clouds that do not give precipitation. He's not talking about them. He's talking about clouds that are meant to give rain, okay? He said, these clouds are false. They're without water. That's a picture of some of these individuals. They, they, they come in among you. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, they give you great swelling words and so forth and so on. But they don't give you the truth. They, they're empty, they're not giving you the truth of God's Word. So he, represent, he, he gives that by uh, representation of a cloud. They cared about of winds, trees, whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. He says, boy, these guys are not worthy in your life. So turn back to the book of 2 Peter real quickly. He gives all those things. And you can go back and read the other things. Like example, they, uh, they do things in excess of sensuality, uh, blasphemy, exploitation, uh, so forth and so on. But they, they take and they completely deceive God's people. And don't think you can't be deceived by somebody. Keep your antennas up in the air. Make sure that you are aware of individuals who might come in to try to turn you away from the Lord. So, let me give you some thoughts real quick. Look back here at 2 Peter real quickly. I'm not, I, I got several other things I could give you. But uh, we've got to be careful in regards to life, uh, our lives that we submit to God. Matter of fact, James chapter 4 verse 7 talks about submitting ourselves to God. So, look at verse number 12 tonight in 2 Peter. And let me give you some things that will help you identify these individuals who are trying to overtake your life and overtake my life, turn us away from God, that we cannot be a blessing to other people and we cannot be blessed ourselves. All right, look at verse number 12, if you would. Number one, they are brute beasts. 
Look at it. But these, as natural brute believe, uh, beasts, uh, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not. Uh, beasts have one goal in mind, and that is this. To devour you. To destroy you. To disrupt. Huh? All three of those things, that is a goal of a beast. And these false teachers are like animals that just rely on the, uh, their own instinct, and that is destroy, disrupt, divide, all right? So he identifies. So the first thing you need to recognize, if you begin to see someone who is, is begin to devour you with their words and so forth and so on, and bring in disruption into your life, and they go into the area of deception, you can nail them right off the bat. They're brute beasts. They're false teachers. But wait a minute. Peter doesn't stop there. Look at verse number 13. They are deceptive. They are deceptive. Why? Because, because uh, they come in, as the Bible says, they come in with, uh, you know, sheep, uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, wolves with sheep's clothing. I'll get it out there in a minute. We've got to be careful. Everything that comes down the road is not the true thing. And so they're deceptive. Uh, there in verse number 13 it says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. They count it pleasure to write in the daytime, spots so they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're completely deceptive in everything they talk about and do. And listen, they don't have any reservations. Are you listening? They have no reservations whatsoever to take and come right in and try to be deceptive uh, in fellowshipping with you, uh, going along with things, and all of a sudden, they pounce on you. They begin to do this. They begin to divide. They begin to disrupt. And, of course, most of all, they begin to deceive you and me in their pernicious ways. But there's a third thing. Look at verse number 14 through 16. They have evil eyes and full of sin. Look at it, verse 14. And have an eyes full of what? All right, now, what's the word adultery mean there? It means all kinds of sensuality. All right? All kinds of sensuality. Everything becomes sensual in their life. The church of Corinth had that happen to them. Read about it. And Paul had to write there in, the first, in first Corinthians about the sensuality was going on in the church of Corinth. Why? Because these individuals walked in and said, it's all right. Uh, listen, I'm saved. I can do anything I want. I have liberty. Uh-uh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Brethren, you be called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to what? The flesh. Sensuality. All right? So, he says, I want to protect you. And here's the third thing about the identifying of these individuals. They're not only brute beasts. They're not only deceptive. But their eyes are full of sinful, sensual pleasures. You can do anything you want to do. It'll be okay. After all, God forgives us, doesn't he? And God does forgive us. But he says, brethren, look. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Let me sit there a little bit and talk to you. We're in a very sensual society. And I want to tell you something. Premarital sex is wrong. Living with somebody that you're not to live with before you get married is wrong. Well, it's getting weak in here. It's absolute, it's not only wrong, it's sinful. It's against God. But in our society today, it's all right to go ahead and live with somebody. Well, after all, we're just, you know, trying things out, you know, if they're okay or whatever. No, that's wrong. That's against God's word, and it's never right. So, we've got to be careful. And in our society today, that's a permissible thing. Well, you know, uh, they're living there. Now, I'm not talking about just young people. Listen to me. I'm talking about it's wrong for older adults simply because, you know, they'll be hurt financially if they get married. It's still wrong. Come on. I see it all the time. 
I see, uh, and I know it's difficult if one person's living on Social Security, another living on Social Security, they put the things together and are able to make it. Our society has made it that way. It shouldn't be that way. Our government has made it that way to take uh, away uh, that which uh, somebody earned and uh, a loved one passes away and the wife is by herself and she's having a hard time making it. So some guy comes along and they kind of get together and they're not going to get, if they get married, guess what? One of that, that's taken away. So they live together. How do you know, preacher? I've dealt with that thing for years as a pastor. I mean, I'm talking about good Christians overall, until they do what's wrong, living with one another because they don't want to give up that other part. Listen, God's Word says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's never right to do wrong in order to do right. God says it's wrong. So, uh, uh, we got to be careful. And uh, Peter, as well as Jude, chime in together and say, listen, be careful. Look at verse 14. Have an eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Uh, they take these individuals kind of up and down, up and down in the Christian life. You know, like a wave tossed on the sea. As James talks about it in James chapter 1. And uh, he says, uh, they, they get, them, uh, you know, get them going and then they become more unstable. And heart they have ex exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Which have Look at verse 15. Which have forsaken, say it with me again, the right way. Uh, here's the problem. They knew what was right, but they turned away from it. You say, what do we find that in the Bible as an illustration? Take your Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. It's a great chapter. We find there, and we know that all things work together for good to them of God, to them are called according to His purpose. Excuse me, I, I said Romans chapter 8. I, it's Romans chapter 1. I don't know where my mind's going tonight. Romans chapter 1. Look down at um, verse number 21. Now here's what's happening in our society today. And like I say, I'm not trying to be so negative. I'm trying to give you indicators of those who are coming in among us today and are turning things upside down because they're going against what God says is the right way. Look there, if you would, at verse number 21. One, because that when they say the next, next two words with me, knew God. They, they understood who God was. They understood uh, about things. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and the foolish heart was darkened. Remember, it all starts in the heart. Uh, the perception got off, you know. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Now stop there and look up here. What is a fool? A fool is one who knows what's right to do, but doesn't do it. Who's a wise person? A person who knows what's right to do and does it. And so Paul even says, look, here's the problem. Professing themselves to be wise, became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an, an image made like an incorruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God said, okay, you went your way. You want to go that direction? He gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now you can read the rest of it and you'll find out some individuals what happened to them in that particular section and we have it all over our country today. And folks, it's not getting any better. And that's a sad thing because it throws a negative into our lives. Hey, isn't anything going to get better? Listen, the only thing that's going to get better is we know Jesus has his final word. And one of these days, he's going to take us out of this mess. All right? But until then, we're here. And let's keep on keeping on. Let's keep on serving God. So we need to be careful about listening to the wrong people because they have evil eyes and full of sin. Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that I've realized up through the years that uh, the devil is not out for us. Can I hear an amen? Devil's not for you. 
So look back at 2 Peter real quickly and look there at verse number 16. Well, let me read verse 15 along with it. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. In other words, he wanted to get things for gain. And, and we're in a, everything's about for gain today. You know, they want to they get uh, money for this or money for that and so forth and so on. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice which forbade the madness of the prophet. God will tell you what's right, and he will give you all kinds of ways that you'll know what the truth is. I mean, uh, he, he, hey, listen, today we have more uh, uh, ways of spreading the gospel, more ways of spreading the truth than we ever had in all history. But man rejects it. And when you begin to reject God's word, you and I are going to fall in to the wrong footsteps. And so we got to be careful. And so we have it here that God gives us what we should do. What should we do? Well, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And look down at verse number 14, if you would, please. You see, the greed of these false teachers continually finds new ways to exploit you and me and exploit those who are, are, are you know, they're comfortable in their own zones and, and they think, okay, everything's going okay, and they don't realize they're being attacked. They don't realize they're being targeted by these individuals. And we've got to be careful. All right, look there, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and look at verse 14. Here's some encouragement for you and me when we face these individuals as we looked at tonight in, in here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 10 through 16. He wants to encourage us. So Paul says, look, now thanks be unto God which always causes us to do what? To triumph in Christ. Now listen to me. Look up here if you would please. Our victory is through Jesus Christ. In Romans, he says, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. But he doesn't stop there. Look at the rest of the verse. And make us manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Now, look up here. He gives those two statements because God's not only concerned about you and me, and He is. And I'm so grateful. Why? Because we're the children of God. Amen? But He's not just concerned about us. He's concerned about those who are going to perish without Jesus Christ. He's concerned about them. And you and I have to constantly be aware of those who would target us. But we also need to help those who are unsaved to realize they're being targeted not only by the devil, but all his cohorts, all the false teachers, all the apostates that are among us in the world today. Now, look back, if you would, at verse number 16. To the one, we are the Savior of death unto death, and to the other, the Savior of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Now, I'm going to show you a verse before I close tonight. He says, we're not of those which corrupt the Word of God, but as of ser ser uh, uh, sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now, if you would, turn back to the book of Jude real quickly. I know we're studying 2 Peter, but we have to look at this verse too. And folks are with us on Wednesday night. I've already seen this. But if you look at verse number 3 of the book of Jude. He says, Beloved, are you listening? I'm concerned about you. You are beloved. Jesus is the beloved. John was called the beloved. He says, you're the beloved. He said, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He says, my intent was the right about common salvation. But the Holy Spirit reaches over, taps me on the shoulder and says, wait a minute, Jude, don't write about common salvation. I want you to write about this. What do you write about? Write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He says, go back to good biblical principles. Go back to the Bible. Why? Look at this verse, and I'll close with this. For there are certain men crept in unawares, 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, now read the rest of the verse with me. Here we go. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now what's that? What's lasciviousness? Talk with me. Lasciviousness is anything that they can get gain for. All right? Lasciviousness is anything that they can get out of you Anything they can do to turn you away from the righteousness of Jesus Christ to do other things. Look at the latter part. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only way whereby you and I must be saved. You see, the devil is out to keep as many people out of heaven as he possibly can. And if he can't do that to your life, he's going to try to disrupt your life. Are you listening? He's going to try to disrupt your life to get you off track, that you're not the right type of example before other people, so they may see your good works, and the end result, glorify the Father in heaven, and come to know Christ as your Savior. You remember the statement? The only Bible that somebody might read may be your what? Your life. So Jude and Peter drive home to us to make us aware that we're being targeted day by day. Don't fall prey to these individuals that he's identified that are there to devour your life, to get you to depart from the faith, to get you uh, deceived into following wrong things that will not glorify God in your life. God says, look, I have the answer. Here's the answer. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. With this verse, I'll close. Romans chapter 8. And I want you to read the verse out loud with me, if you would, please. Look down, if you would, there. At uh, verse number 31 again. He says, verse 31. Let's read it together. What shall we then say to these what? These things. Uh, whatever they might be that do not glorify God. You can look back to the previous verses. All right. So read the, verse, the rest of the verse with me. If God be for us, who could be against us? Who can be against us? The devil is. But greater, come on, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And that's the devil. You bow your heads in prayer with me, please. With our heads bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask you a question. Are you targeted tonight? Of course, the answer is yes. Most of all, if you're here tonight and you've never come to know personal faith in Jesus Christ, you're a target for the devil. He's going to try to do everything he can to get you uh, to receive some other way that you think you can go to heaven. He's done that on many occasions. If he can't get you with keeping sacraments, he'll get you with the matter of you think you have to get baptized to be saved or become a member of the church or do good works or do good works to keep your salvation, whatever it might be. He's going to do everything he possibly can. But he's going to hit those who are saved as well as those who are unsaved. What area of your life is he targeting you right now? Is there something that you have permitted to come into your life that is dragging you down, that's pulling you away from that close walk with Jesus? And you're letting it drift in your life and you become a target for his nephrous ways. The devil is no respecter of person. And he does it to the young as well as the old. And tonight, God wants you to know if there's something that you're being vulnerable to, it's going to destroy your life. That snake is not going to always be a calm pet. It's one of these days going to wrap around you and crush every bone in your body. That, 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 that lion is not going to be something that's going to be tamed all the time. It's going to come to its full nature again. And it's going to lunge at you and rip you to pieces. Don't let it happen. Be obedient to the Lord. 
in just a few seconds, we're going to give our usual invitation. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, if you don't know you'd go to heaven if you were to die, I trust right there in your seat right now, you will be willing to admit to God you're a lost sinner that Jesus died upon the cross for your sins. And if you will ask him to save you from your heart, he'll do so. Because he's the son of God who died for you and wants you to be saved. Christian, if you're here tonight and you need to do business with God, here's the altar. Here's these front pews in case you cannot kneel. And you'd like to come tonight, I encourage you to do so. Don't fall prey to a false teacher or those who may creep in to try to destroy your life. But let God have his way in your life. Would you stand with me tonight and have a word of prayer? Father in heaven, I pray you would bless your word now. I pray as we have a song of invitation. I pray that you just work in each one of our hearts. And that we will not let the devil take advantage of us in anything that might destroy our lives and pull us away from you. We know we're saved. But... Our influence will be great against maybe somebody's life that needs to be saved. And so, Lord, help us to stay near you. Draw us close to you. Help us not to fall prey and become targets of the devil. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed. We're not going to sing tonight. I'm going to have Brother Fred to sing and Irene play the piano. If God's spoken in your heart, Brother Robert's up here in front. He'll be glad to pray with you or have somebody pray with you. But if God's spoken in your heart, I want to invite you to come tonight and just do business with God. As he begins to sing his first verse, would you step out and come? <laughs>